40. And I saw one of its heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all of the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. God blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who could dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, uh, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. And he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. And he who kills him with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This beast is the Antichrist. And this is only, only the, the, the beginning of what we'll talk about. But uh, before we talk, before I get into this description of the Antichrist, I'm going to read, I'll go all the way back to the book of Daniel. And Daniel, uh, you know, we all know that he was in the lion's den and, and uh, did a few other things. Uh, few other things he, he uh, and, and, but uh, he also had these amazing visions of the end of the world these visions of the Antichrist and so I'm going to read to you what Daniel saw in the first year of Belshazzar the king of Chaldeans Daniel saw a dream and visions in his head and upon his bed and he wrote down the dream I Daniel looked on in my vision in the night and behold the four winds of heaven blew violently upon the great sea then four large beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lioness and had the wings of an eagle. I looked on it and looked until its wings were plucked out. And it was uh, driven from the earth and made to stand on human feet. And a human heart was given to it. And after this, behold, there was a second beast like a bear. And it rose up on one side and had three ribs in his mouth between its teeth. And thus they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this, I kept looking. And behold, there was another beast, like a leopard, and it had four wings uh, of a bird on its back. And there were also four heads of the beast, and authority was given to it. And after this, I looked, and behold, a fourth beast, fearful, terrifying, and exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, and it was devouring, uh, devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling underfoot whatever was left. It was exceedingly different from all the beasts before it, and it had ten horns. And I was especially noticing its horns, and behold, there was another horn, a little one, and it came, came up among them, and the three horns of those before it were uprooted because of its presence. And behold, there were eyes like the eyes of a man in this horn, and it had a mouth speaking arrogant things. That's in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. Now having heard both of those images, those visions, we can begin to notice some similarities. First, there's a beast that rises up from the sea. And, uh, and, and uh, this, and, and in, in Revelation, this beast has seven heads, ten horns, and crowns. Where did we hear that, like, last week? This is the dragon, the great red dragon, with seven heads, uh, ten horns, and crowns. But this isn't the dragon, this is a beast, and the dragon gives its power to the beast. So this just tells us that the dragon and this beast are related. They're, 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 there's a kinship between them. And, it's, and, the, and this beast rises from the sea. And, and, and if you stop and think about, you know, here, here's this beast and it has crowns on his head and it's rising out of the heads and it's rising out of the sea. If you put, if you put, uh, if you put your hand under, under the water and the, uh, or, or under a flat surface and then you rise up slowly, you don't see the whole hand at once, you see a bunch of little fingers. And then you see how they come together, and then all the heads come together into the body. It's a gradual revelation. It's not something that's going to happen all at once. We're not going to look up and blink and, oh, there's the Antichrist. Well, we might. Because, but, but if we look at it closely, we'll see that that has been happening all along. We've seen those, those horns rising up slowly. We've seen the heads. We've seen these things happening, and all of a sudden, we, they all come together. And, it's the, and it is the Antichrist. So this is not something that happens quickly, but something that happens slowly. Now, St. Hippolytus of Rome, uh, who was a disciple of St. Irenaeus, 
uh, of Lyon. Uh, St. Hippolytus wrote him a treatise on uh, Christ and Antichrist, and he addresses what we just heard about from Daniel. Now, he says that, uh, that, 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 that the first beast, the lioness with wings, with wings like an eagle, and this is this, oh, he, first he says all, the, all of these, that this dream relates to the, to the uh, dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Remember, there he saw a great statue and a head of gold and a, and, 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 and a chest of brass and loins, or a chest of silver, loins of brass and legs of iron and toes of iron and clay mixed. And a great stone uh, comes out of the mountain and crushes this, crushes this uh, uh, a statue and, 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 it, uh, and, and encompasses the entire statue. And uh, Daniel says that this was, these were the, the, the great umpires of the earth. And, and uh, he also said, and, and also in this dream now, St. Hippolytus says, these are the same empires. So this lioness with the wings of eagle, of eagle, this relates to the head of gold. This is the empire, the Babylonian empire, the empire of Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> and it, Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up, as it were, on wings, and he, was, and, and he exalted himself against God. And the wings, therefore, were plucked because of this. And his glory was destroyed, and he was driven out of his kingdom. But then he stood up on his feet and was given the heart of a man. Remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar. He blasphemed God, and as a result, he went basically mad for, 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 for some years. And he, he, he thought he was a beast. And he went out in the field and ate, ate grass like a cow. And this was, his, this was who he was. I mean, he was, he was insane for a period of time. And then God healed him. And he stood up like a man. And he was given the heart of a man. So this, this beast that was, first his, his, his glory, his, his wings are plucked. His glory is taken away. But then he's raised up and given the heart of a man because of his repentance. And this beast is, 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 is driven away by the next beast. A bear with three ribs in his mouth. This is the breast of silver. This is the Persian king, the, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, which overthrew Babylon. And it has three ribs in his mouth because that kingdom was made up of three separate peoples, the Medes, the Persians, and the Babylonians, whom they conquered. Now this, and, and this beast was, was, was also sur, uh, supplanted by the third beast, a leopard with four wings and four heads. And, and this, this, these are the loins of brass. This is, the, this is the, the kingdom of Alexander. Alexander came and he conquered the Persian Empire. And all of, all of the, the civilized world was then under Alexander. And Alexander divided his kingdom up into four parts. And so the, bees, the leopard has four wings and four heads. Uh, denoting this division of the, of, the, of the Greek Empire, the Empire of Alexander, into four parts. And finally, there's this dreadful beast, a dreadful and terrible beast with iron teeth and claws of brass. And this is Rome. This is the legs of the iron of the statue. And Rome rises up and consumes the entire world and, 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 and sits over the entire world, oppressing it, as it were, and, and, and like I said, with, 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 teeth of, with teeth of iron and legs and claws of brass, rending and, and, breaking, and breaking apart. But Rome itself, then, was broken into many smaller parts, smaller kingdoms. The toes, the toes of the beast, or the, the toes of the statue of brass and clay, that remnant of the Roman, king, the, the Roman Empire mixed with the clay of the barbarian kingdoms. And so we have, we have these ten horns, these, a multitude of small little kingdoms. Uh, what, and what today we might, we might consider to be uh, Western Europe. These are the remnants of the Roman Empire. And, um, and so it's Western, Western Europe, North Africa, North America. And, and, and so these are the ten horns, and they're all crowned. They all have authority. They're all separate kingdoms. And then another horn arises in, in, in Daniel. Another horn arises, supplants three of the, three of the uh, existing horns, and it has eyes and a mouth. And it 
dominates all of the other horns. And this is the Antichrist, who, 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 make, who, 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 who rises up in the midst of these little kingdoms and overpowers them and, and, and rises to prominence. And this horn has an eyes and a mouth and it, and it spews blasphemies of God. Now, let's go back to Revelation. Here we have another beast rising out of the sea. And this beast was like a leopard. Persian. With claw, with, or, I'm sorry, a leopard. Uh, Alexander. Yes, thank you. This, it was like a leopard, like Alexander, but with feet like a bear. Ah, Persian. With a mouth, a face like a lion. And we go all the way back to Nebuchadnezzar. And here we have this beast, which encompasses all of the beasts of Daniel's dream. Here now again, rising up out of the sea. So this is the, all of these things are linked. All of these things are connected. The beast and the the beast from the sea and the dragon. The beast from the sea and the, and, and the, the vision of Daniel. All of these things are connected. And and, uh, and and so this beast is rising out of the sea. And the fathers say that this is the sea of life, which is indeed the human race. This beast is a man, a human being. He is not an incarnate spirit. He's not Satan incarnate because Satan can't become incarnate. Satan can't make anybody incarnate. The incarnation is, the, is only within the power of the creator. Only God could become incarnate. And so Satan does the next best thing. He finds a person who is amenable to his will, completely, totally, and 100% on his side. And this reminds me of the, the life of St. Cyprian and Eustina. And uh, St. Cyprian was a great sorcerer. And he was like this man. He was so accomplished in all of, this, uh, in all of the, the magic arts. And he could command demons. Even Satan himself said, this is my friend. I, when he, when, you know, he is going to rule with me in my kingdom. This is the kind of man that the Antichrist was. Or will be. St. Cyprian, by God's grace, was enlightened. He tried, he tried to... Uh, he, he, he tried to overwhelm uh, Justina, who was, a, who was a, a young virgin who had dedicated her life to Christ. And uh, he tried to overwhelm her and tempt her. And every time he sent a demon to her, the demon sit, came back and said, I can't even get close. And Cyprian is saying, what in the world is going on here? And so he realizes that here is a power greater than all of the powers that he commanded. And he says, I have to find out about this. And so he goes to the bishop and he gives him all of his books of sorcery. And it's not like these books that are printed on a printing press and bound in a factory and, 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 mail, and, and sent by the case. No, these were handwritten you know, books which were, which were copied and, and created one of a kind, one of a kind. And he takes the whole library. Cyprian has a whole library of these things. And he takes this whole library, gives it to the bishop, says, burn these and teach me about Christ. And indeed, he repented. And became a great. Uh, uh, he, he he became a very great Christian. In fact, was was made uh, eventually made bishop of Antioch. So this is. It's, but but Cyprian before his enlightenment, this great servant of Satan. This is the kind of person that this, that the Antichrist will be, a one who is fully and completely dedicated to the service of Satan, to the worship of Satan. And his character is dark and evil. He's a beast, which, which he, he's portrayed as a beast with heads and horns, just like the dragon. And this, 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 uh, this, this speaks to his, to his uh, uh, personality. He's, inhum he's inhumanly cruel. He's bloodthirsty. He's domineering. He's, he's, he, he's, he, he's evil. And, uh, and he has seven heads and ten horns. This is his kinship with the devil. Mm -hmm. and, the horn, and the heads are crowned with a name of blasphemy. Now, we have to stop for a minute and ask, what is blasphemy? When you think about blasphemy, a person who blasphemes, many people, when they hear this, they say, oh, that's a, that's a person with a really foul mouth, you know, like talks like a sailor. 
you know, who curses and swears and says horrible things. This is not a blasphemer. A person who blasphemes, blasphemy, this is to deny the incarnation. This is what blasphemy is. And so these beasts, the, these heads of this beast, are going to, to deny that Jesus Christ is God who became flesh, that he, he is God incarnate. And, and this, will, this, will be a, this is a mark of the Antichrist, Antichrist's rule, that he will do everything to, to, to uh, completely set aside Christ, to completely discredit Christ, to, to, and, 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 to, and, and to put himself in that place. And so, he, so the first thing that he does, or, or one of the main things that he does, is he speaks blasphemy. He denies the incarnation of Christ, that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man, the very thing that we confess every time we say the creed, the creed is that he is fully God and fully man. And so uh, this, this is the blasphemy that comes from the, that, that comes from the Antichrist. And, you know, it can be couched in very academic terms. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, there was this big academic movement to discover the historical Jesus. Who was Jesus as a man? I gotta tell you, these guys bent over backwards not to say that he was God. They did everything in their power to say, there's no way he's God. All of his miracles, they were hallucinating, a mass hallucination. Or the disciples just kind of made all this up from, they concantated a number of things that happened. And they just kind of wrote these things together and they colluded and, and, and all of these things. And it's, it's craziness. They bent over backwards to avoid the obvious. And the obvious is that Jesus is God who has become a man. But it was all very academic. It's actually all very boring. <laughs> and it's all very polite and nice. But it's blasphemy. Blasphemy can come in all shades. It can be crude and rude and socially unacceptable. But it also can be polite. It can be learned. It can be intellectual. It can be kind and gentle. But in the end, what it is, is a denial of the incarnation. And this is, a, the, the, have, because it is written on the heads of the beast, this is an open declaration of their inner of the, of the beast's inner impiety, despising everything that is holy. And the ten horns are crowned. They have political, and they are, they are kings who have political and temporal power. And they are united under the, under the Antichrist. And one of the heads, it says, was mortally wounded and was healed. This is this the the the, the interpreters, the, the, the fathers say if this is either that the Antichrist himself is wounded and thought to be dead, and then he, I won't say resurrects, but he appears to resurrect. He appears to resurrect. And he uses this miracle as, as, as something, as a, as, a, as a proof that he is just like Jesus Christ. Or, they say, this is the, the, that it wasn't he himself but it was one of his close uh, 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 generals, one of, one of these 10 kings that are allied to him, who was mortally wounded, and the Antichrist raises him up from the dead as proof of his power. And so this is a false, a, a false resurrection, a faux resurrection. The Antichrist imitates Christ. And hence, and, and therefore we have a mention of this head that was wounded and was healed. And that, and that very statement, in that very statement, we know that this is not like Christ. Because when our Lord rose from the dead and appeared to the apostles in the upper room, the wounds weren't healed. Put your finger in the print of the nail in my hand. Thrust your hand into my side. The wounds weren't healed, and even now, we will see, when we see him face to face, we will see those wounds, not as tragic things, but as, 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 as great 
adornments, as evidence of his glory, of his power, of what he has overcome and what he suffered and overcame for our sake. And so, but in this case, the dragon, the, 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 I'm sorry, the Antichrist, the head is, or the wounds are healed. And it says, and, and, and you know, the, it says that, uh, that, that when he comes, or when the Antichrist, let's see, it said, uh, that, there, the, 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 that the people would shout about, uh, that, that they, who was like the beast and who was able to make war with him. This is an indication that indeed he fought wars. He was a political leader. He was a military leader. He was someone who, who conquered the entire earth. He is someone who conquers the entire earth. And he is not a man of peace, but is a political warlord. He displaces, absolutely displaces at least three of those ten kingdoms and absorbs them into himself, pushes them out by their roots. This is the kind of man that the Antichrist is. But because he is so powerful, he will draw all the world to himself by his power, by his might. He will draw all, of, all the world to himself, all of those who are will worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. So he blasphemes God. He blasphemes his temple. He blasphemes heaven. He blasphemes Jesus Christ, who is the God who became man. He blasphemes his temple, that is the abode of Christ, his body, the church where he dwells on this earth. And he blasphemes heaven, those, the, the choir of the saints. He blas he, 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 his blasphemies will attempt to discredit everything godly and everything holy. And then it, Daniel, Daniel says again, and the Antichrist will devise a way to change the times and the laws. In other words, he will attempt to overcome nature and will do away with the law of God. What is the law of God? The law of God is, is, are those things which teach us how to live. You know, uh, honor your mother and father. You only have, have only one God before you. Keep the Sabbath holy. Uh, don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. You know, all of these things. These are the law, this is the law of God. What, is, what else is the law of God? Blessed are the poor, poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn for their sins. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is the law of God. This is the way we should be living. This is the guideline for our life. And the Antichrist will do away with it. He'll do, it, do away with all morality, all righteousness. He replaces the love of God and the love of neighbor, which is the greatest law. The law that is above all laws, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. He replaces that with his own law, and that is to love yourself. And so, and, and so this, is, this, is, this is the attempt of the Antichrist to displace the law of God and, and, and to displace righteousness and replace it with his own immorality, his own way of life, which is indeed uh, certainly not heavenly. Uh, and he's given power, it says, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Take note, the Antichrist will turn his violence and cruelty, once he's conquered the world, he'll turn his violence and cruelty against the church. And he will seemingly prevail. That's what it says. He's given, he's given the power to, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. We who are in Christ will not escape this persecution. So we go back for our example as to what will happen. What will it be like? What will it be like for us? We go back to the first martyrs. The martyrs under the Roman Empire. Some of them just kept their heads down. Some of them fled, fled out into the, into, the, into the wilderness. And some of them stood and were martyred and suffered on, on behalf of Christ. And this is what it will be like for us in this time. Some 
will manage to remain invisible for at least a period, some period of time. Some will flee to the wilderness, striving to find safety there, and some will be persecuted and killed for Christ's sake. And when we think about how the martyrs reacted, when they were confronted with this persecution, it's really amazing. Yes, they ran. Some of them ran and hid. Yes. But when eventually the persecution caught up with them, they didn't fight back. In fact, uh, there, there are a number of stories like this. The one, one that comes to mind that is one of my favorites is uh, St. Longinus, the centurion at the cross. He left. He found a, a little house in some small village, and he lived there in obscurity until the emperor finally found where he was, and he sent soldiers to arrest him and bring him back that he might be killed. And, he, and so the soldiers, they get to this little town, and they stop at this house and say, we're looking for this centurion Longinus. Where is he? And the occupant of the house, who is Longinus himself, says, ah, you know, it's late. Come on in. Let me, let me give you something to eat. Sleep here, and tomorrow I will take you to him. And the soldier said, okay, fine, free meal, free, free place to stay, we're in. You know, and so he, they come in, and he feeds them, he gives them a place to stay, and then he himself retires into his own, in, into his own private room, his own space. And there, he spends the night in prayer, he spends the night preparing for the fact that tomorrow he will suffer for Christ. And so he comes out in the morning, and he says to the soldier, and the soldiers say, well, we're ready to go. Take us to Longinus. He said, he is the one who stands before you. And the soldiers say, well, wait, wait. No, you are too nice. We cannot take you. I'll tell you what. We're going to turn around, count 10. You run away as fast as you can. He says, no, no. You, you have orders. Follow, you know, if you don't follow your orders, you're going to go back and you're going to get killed. Because that's the way the problem was. He says, no, follow your orders. I, go, I will go willingly with you. And he went willingly with them to his own martyrdom. This is how it will be for us. Some of us will flee and hide. Some of us will, will, will lapse into obscurity. Some of us will be martyred. But in every case, the one thing that protects us, the one thing that gives us the power to overcome is the fact that we depend on our Lord Jesus Christ and on nothing else. We are united to Him. His grace, His strength, His power, this upholds us. You know, we read about the terrible struggle, the terrible sufferings of the martyrs. You know, I don't think any one of them, any one of them, had any idea that he could actually endure when he went in. He just knew that somehow God would take care of him. And God did. He gave them strength. He made it so that so that in some cases they didn't even feel the torment. They were, you know, martyrs were thrown into the fire and, 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 and they were bedewed like, the, cho the, like the, the three holy children in the furnace in Babylon. <clears throat> they, they, in the, um, they were stoned, but the stones turned around and hit, hit the ones who were throwing stones. God preserved them. They had no idea this was going to happen. They were ready to die. They were ready to give their life to Christ because as Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They knew that this is what awaited them. And so they were eager to leave the body behind and be present with the Lord. And many times, you know, the, 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 persecutor, the persecutor would stop for a minute and say, would you do yourself a favor here? You know, if you recant, if you offer the sacrifice to idols, you can come and I will give, you know, all of this will stop and you will live in riches and luxury for the rest of your life. That's all. And you know what the martyrs, and, 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 and the martyrs said, no, no. In fact, some of them said, you have power over our bodies, but you do not have power over our souls. We can, you can do whatever you want to our bodies. God's giving you that power. But you can't touch our souls. You can't touch us in eternity. This is, 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 is what God has, has, has reserved for, for us. 
And so the beast will be in this this uh, this beast, this antichrist will be in power for 42 months, three and a half years, a time, a, a time times and half a time. The same period of time, interestingly enough, or not maybe not so strangely, as the two witnesses are preaching. They are preaching against the Antichrist the entire time that he is attempting to rule. And so he, he's, given, he's given this amount of time, this short amount of time, during which he, 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 he attempts to overcome, um, overcome Christ, Jesus Christ. And, all who's, and it says, all who are not written in the book of life shall worship him. That's why we want to make sure. We want to make sure that that's where we are. We want to be written, or have our names written in the book of Christ. How do we do that? We go back again to, the, to what we saw before. And, and uh, where, where God sent an angel to mark with his seal those who will be preserved. Those who were faithful to him. We are marked with the seal of Christ. And what is that seal? It's the sign of the cross. It's the cross that was given to us at baptism. It's the cross that we make over ourselves day in and day out. It's the cross with which we were anointed with oil this evening. This is the seal of Christ. This is the mark of Christ. This indicates that we are indeed written in the book of life. Not the outer manifestation itself. But if this cross indeed is not just on the outside, but is on the inside, is in our hearts, this is, the, is, is, is what writes us in, in the book of life. And all who are not written in the book of life will worship the beast. Now how is it that such a violent, ruthless, and evil man is worshipped? How did he get so popular? Well, that's the next part of this chapter. And then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, he, uh, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even he makes fire come down from heaven and the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth and those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast and that image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads, so that no one may buy or sell except the one who is the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 6,666. How is it that such a violent, ruthless man is worshipped? He has help. This is the second beast, the false prophet. This is another beast rising out of the earth. The, 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 the Antichrist rises out of the sea. This beast rises out of the earth. And this beast rising from the earth has two horns, like a lamb. And he will appear lamb-like. He will appear peaceful. He will appear kind and gentle. He will appear to be self-effacing. But he speaks like a dragon. And what does the dragon speak? He speaks lies and deceit. Because Satan is a liar and the father of lies. This false prophet, who looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He might be very possibly a religious or a spiritual figure who prepares the way for the Antichrist. He is the one who kind of moderates the ruthlessness of the Antichrist and makes it palatable for those who want, uh, who, who want uh, uh, someone who's meek and mild and comforting and loving. He is the, he is the deceiving ally the mouthpiece of the beast, the one who makes him palatable to all the rest of the earth. He has power to work miracles and to give signs. He calls down fire from heaven. 
And these signs are based in deception. He will think he will make they will appear to be things that they are not. And indeed, we know that the demons can do this. Although this will be a man and not a demon. But by the power of demons, we know these things can happen. There's a, there's, there are a multitude of accounts of uh, monastics who were deceived by these appearances. Uh, there, there, there's one that I read just recently of a, of a monk who, who was on the holy mountain. And he lived in, 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 he was a hermit, he lived in isolation. And he did nothing but pray all day, every day. And he was, he was very pious and holy and close to God. And all of a sudden, he receives a visit from these, from, from these noble visitors from the court in Constantinople. And they say, the patriarch has, has, has died. And what did this monk know? He li he's, lives out in the middle of nowhere. He just hasn't getting any notes. The patriarch has died, and you have been chosen to be his successor. We have heard of your holiness, and we will bring you to Constantinople, and you will become the patriarch. And the, and, and the monk says, oh, no, I'm not worthy. And this goes on back and forth for a couple of days. And finally, he says, if it's the will of God, let it be so. I will go with you. And so he follows these noblemen, and they have a, a ship a docked at, uh, uh, right there on, uh, on the shore of the Holy Mountain. And so they're going to get on the ship, and they're going and, and to go sail to Constantinople. And so this monk, he doesn't know any different. He just does what he does. He does what's right. So before he steps off land and onto the ship, he bows down and makes the sign of the cross multiple times. And he stands up, and there's no ship. And no, no woman, no nothing. This was all the deceit of the demons. This was all an image, an illusion, to lure him onto the ship so that he would be following the demons. And then they would sink the ship and he would be lost at the last moment without even an opportunity to repent. So they're capable. They're capable of these elaborate deceptions. And this prophet, this false prophet, will wield that power. He is also, he will also be capable of such great deceptions. And he will lure all of those who are, have their doubts, he will lure them into the, into the worship of the beast. I just turned two pages. And he makes an image of the beast and he causes it to speak. Now, when you read the interpretation of the, of the fathers, they say, well, you know, he's going to make this, this, this idol, this statue of the beast, and he'll cause it to speak. But they didn't have cell phones with apps that could show us a face and make it speak at us. So, who knows? But he makes an image of the beast, and this image speaks to us, and it deceives those that dwell on the earth, and everyone that does not therefore worship the beast, that image, that magical image, is, is, is put to death. So, this is the primary role of the false prophet, to deceive those that dwell on the earth, to bring them under the power of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the power, and the strength, and the might. But the false prophet is the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. He is the bait, he is the bait on the hook. And it says that anyone who does not have the mark of the beast on his hand and on his forehead can neither buy nor sell. And then it says, and, and, and so this is the mark of the beast. Or the, the, this, this is the number of the name of the beast. John doesn't tell us the name. He just said that it gives us this number. 600, 600, 666. And that is, and, and, and we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second, but let's talk about the mark of the beast in general. Like I said, it, that mark consists of the name or the number of the beast. And it's in contrast to the mark of Christ. Let me just mention the mark of Christ. What is the mark of Christ? That's the cross. The cross that we bear not only outwardly, not only hanging around our neck or 
or or or that we make with our that we make with our hand. But it's the cross that is marked on our hearts. This is the mark of Christ. And those who don't have the mark of Christ will be given the mark of the beast. And it will be put on either the right hand or the forehead. The right hand indicates our ability to do good deeds. And the forehead indicates the control of thoughts. The mark of slavery in antiquity was put on either the forehead or on the, on, on, on the, on the hand. It was either put on the, forehead, on the forehead for a slave or a soldier would be marked on his hand. <clears throat> and and uh, it was the, and, and this, this mark that was put on the, on, 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 on the slave, this was the mark of his owner, the owner's name, or his mark, the, the, the signet of his name. Sometimes those marks were put on as persecution. One of the saints, Theodore Graptus, or Theodore the Branded, this was during the time of the, the persecutions of the, the uh, iconoclasts. And Theodore goes, he, he was a friend of the emperor. <laughs> and he goes to the emperor and he says, what are you doing? You can't, you, you can't deny Christ. If you, if you destroy icons, if you outlaw icons, you're, you are denying Christ. What are you doing here? And the emperor threw, you know, he, he's, he's not going to take this kind of sass from, from, from a, a mere monk. And so he, he throws him in jail and, torture, and, and tortures him in prison and brings him back and Theodore hasn't changed at all. And the emperor says, okay, look, if you're going to be that way, and he has branded on his forehead a description of what a horrible person he is, that he, that he was an enemy of the emperor. And he went around for the rest of his life with this brand on his forehead. Of course, for him, it wasn't a mark of shame. For him, it was, a, it was an adornment of glory because, did, because although he wasn't a servant of the emperor, he, although he was an enemy of the emperor, he was a servant and friend of Christ. So, we are branded with the cross because we hope. I trust all of you are. And we strive to be branded with the cross to carry the mark of Christ and not to be branded with the, with the brand of the Antichrist. And it, um, it says that uh, St. Andrew of Caesarea says that the mark of the beast will not be received by those sealed in their faces with the divine light. Now I'm not sure, I, it's, it's hard to say whether he's just saying they won't do it or whether he's saying they won't be able to put the mark on. It won't stick. It won't stay. But it will, you know, uh, uh, either way, whatever it is. But notice he says, whose, fa whose faces shine with the divine light. We bear Christ within ourselves. And many of the saints had that very quality, is that they were so immersed in Jesus Christ that they shone with that divine light. And these times would be so difficult so hard, so demanding that we, that, that those who suffer as well will shine with this same divine light. And it says, if you don't have the mark, you can neither buy nor sell. All commerce, it then, is dependent on the mark of the beast. Those, uh, and, 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 and those who aren't marked, they'll be cut off from all worldly necessities. Food, clothing, shelter, anything that anything that you use money for, it will be there. You say, well, well you, you, you know, I have, I have, I have, I have a lot of savings. I can get by for a while. No, you can't. You get all your savings up, at least if you if you're like me. The vast majority of your resources are tied up in some computer somewhere in some account. Now, all of it takes is one person to say, nope, you don't have access to this anymore. And they're gone. Oh, well, you know, I have cash. Oh, we'll change the cash. We'll change the currency. That's been done more than once. And the old currency doesn't have any value anymore unless you change it in for the new currency. There's a period of the exchange. Or, oh, I have gold and silver. Yeah, you might have those things. 
But if the you can try, you can offer them, but if the person who's selling isn't willing to give it to you, isn't willing to make the exchange, then it's not going to do you any good. There was a there was a, there was a distinction uh, made uh, in a, a book that I read a long time ago about the old Soviet Union is that there was there was a, a there there were some things that were in great supply, and there were some things that were not no supply at all. You could get some things, but there are a lot of things you couldn't get. And some things you could only get if you had access to a certain store. You could have the money to buy anything, but if you didn't have the access to the place where they were selling it, you couldn't buy it. You couldn't have it, no matter how much money you had. So the power to purchase, the money to purchase, and the ability to access the goods are two different things. And so if we think that, oh, we'll get around it, we won't. We won't. But God can, does, and will provide for us. <coughs> Just the other day, we read the life of St. Mary of Egypt. Wonderful life. 18 years, actually longer than that, 18 years she repents in the wilderness, and then there was a, a, a number of years after that. She lives in the wilderness. And she has no food at all, no water. And believe me, that wilderness is pretty barren. There's nothing but rocks out there in the Transjordan wilderness. And that's where she lived. But God took care of her. God provided for her. God fed her. God nourished her. Somehow we don't know how. But she lived all those years with nothing other than what God provided not seeing another person, not even seeing another animal. But God provided for her. Saint Maria of Persia, another martyr, was confessed Christ, was thrown into prison, actually sewn into a bag and thrown in prison, into a dungeon. And there she sat for years, decades, forgotten. And yet, when finally she was brought out, when she was discovered by the, by, by the Christians, and brought out of the bag was open, and she was alive and whole, without food or water or any attention for years, God provided for her. And even after that, she had the gift from God of not eating, not needing to eat at all, even though she continued to live for many years. St. Uh, Gregory of, of, of uh, Armenia, the same way. He was thrown into a pit and left for years. No one, everybody forgot about him. And then there was a regime change, and they found him again and pulled him out, and there he was. Still alive. Had been provided for by God. God can provide for us no matter what, no matter where we are, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. God provides for us. So if we trust in him, if we depend on him, it doesn't matter whether we can buy it or sell. What matters is that we receive what God has given us. This is how we overcome the Antichrist, is by relying on God, by relying on his provision, by relying on his grace, by trusting to, for him to give us everything that we need. And then the, the saint says, and this is the... This is wisdom. The number of the beast, the number of the name of the beast is 666. Now, what that means, at least the, the, most of the commentators, uh, uh, ancient commentators, tell us that th this was a very common way of, 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 of uh, indi indi indicating a name. You would take all the letters of the name, they all had numerical value, and add them up. You add them up, and whatever that total is, that is the indication of what your name is. And um, uh, so, over the centuries, people have tried and tried and tried to come up. What is this name? But you know, there are so many names that could possibly be. There's no way to figure out what the name of the beast is. 
St. Uh, Hippolytus of Rome, who I mentioned earlier, said, oh, the name of it could be Latinos, or it could be Titan, or it could be Evanthus. You know, and, uh, and uh, Archbishop of Verki says, and then some people said it was Julian the Apostate, or, and, or, or some of them took the title of the Pope of Rome uh, in, in Latin, Vicarus uh, Fili Dei, the Vicar of Christ, and added them up so that it, they had to tinker with it a little bit to make it add up correctly. And Napoleon, you can make Napoleon's name add up. Or even the old, the old, uh, the old believers in, in, in Russia in the 1600s uh, made, made out for the name of Patriarch Nikon to add up to 666. There's no way. There's no way we can tell. And St. Abraham says, if it were needed for us to know this name, this, this, uh, the seer of the mystery, St. John, would have revealed it. But the grace of God did not will that, the, that, the, that the, this ruinous name be written in the divine book. This is one of those things that's hidden from us, probably for our benefit. Remember uh, earlier, John heard seven thunders and began to write down what he heard the thunders speak. And he said, wait, don't write. Don't write this down. This is not for publication. St. John knew what the thunders said. But he couldn't tell anyone. Same thing with the with the with the name of the beast. He, he very likely knows the name of the beast or the, the name of the Antichrist, but he can't write it down. Or he can't tell us because this is one of those things that is hidden by God's divine will. We have these signs, all of this book of Revelation. We have these signs not to help us to predict the future. That's, that's, that's of no use and no value at all. But we have these signs so that we can understand the present, understand the present, understand where we are, understand that the end is coming and how close it is. And then when we see these, excuse me, when we see these things, we will see that God knew all of these things were going to happen. He isn't surprised. He knew all of these things were going to happen. He, in fact, permitted all of these things to happen. And he is still in control. He has everything in his hand. This is why we're told all these things. For us to remember that God has everything in his hands. And then it says... Um, And in Daniel, at the, in the end, at the end of Daniel, it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed by the sword. Here is the pace. Oh, I'm sorry. I, think it's, I forget. I, I may have read it. I may have just read it. It slipped my mind. But anyway, here is the patience of the saints. This is God's assurance that this persecutor will receive his payment. The saints will be delivered by their patience. By our patience. Our patience comes from the trust in God's, in God's providence. If we trust in God's providence, then we can be patient. Because we know that God has these things in his hands. He is in control. We can relinquish our needs, our wants, our desires, we can put all of our lives in his hands and trust that he will take care of us. That's why we, that's why we get this. So this is, this is uh, as far as we're going to go uh, this Lent, and we will pick up again next Lent uh, with the next set of seven signs, the seven bowls of God's wrath. Have any questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, that was, was interesting. Uh... So we started talking about Cyprian, and I didn't realize there was another uh, Cyprian, because I kept thinking of the Bishop of Carthage. Uh -huh. I was like, whoa, I don't remember this. But you're mentioning the um, Gregory there, he reminded me of, of, a, of an anecdote that is kind of funny. It's a, it's just a story of the British Museum. And this is not a saint, but he was given as, as a soldier. This is like a you know, recollections of a redcoat, an officer. And there was this village in India, and there was somebody being kept in a pit in the middle of the square. And 
And we asked, why was he down there? Nobody remembered. He'd been there longer than most of them alive. <laughs> and so we said, well, get him out. And there was a little bit of like, oh, we don't, whatever. Finally, he ordered, the, ordered his men to crack the grate open and they pulled him out. The guy was very upset with him. <laughs> very angry indeed, because now, uh, as long as he was in the cage, they would feed him. Now he's out of the cage, they're not going to feed him anymore. So he spat on the guy, and <laughs> that was that. Okay, so well, that's, that's, right. that's not how it works, okay? <laughs> that's not a nice story, but that's not how it works. And usually in India, those, those pits were filled with cobras anyway, so. <laughs> Any other questions or comments, thoughts? You <coughs> talked about the interpretation of the book of Daniel with the different beasts of different nations. Uh-huh. You mentioned Revelation, or, or Daniel too. You talked about the ten horns. Right. That's specific kings. Mm-hmm. Why as kings and not as nations? Why? Because that's the way it's spoken of in the, in, in, in the, in, in the gospel, or in the, in the scripture. That's all. Okay. And, you know, I, I use the words like kings, nations. Keep in mind that, that especially, this is, this is probably the most apparent in French uh, uh, aristocracy, French royalty. The nation. The king is the nation, and the nation is the king. And has been through most of history. Well, when yeah. you look around right now, it's uh, it's hard to tell who's running any country. <laughs> well, they, yeah. they do things, but... Exactly. We have kings, king but they're under orders. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is, the, we, we, you begin to see the mystery, the work of the Antichrist. You know, who, who brings these rulers, these kings together, and while they appear to act independently, <clears throat> indeed they're not, they're not independent, but they are acting under the, un, under the control, as it were, of the interest. We may not see that control, it may still be under the water, but we see that, it, you know, we see, we, we see their actions, and we know that somewhere back there, somewhere under the water, they're all connected. But, yeah, Frosty. I can't remember where I heard or read, but is it true that the Antichrist descends from the tribe of Dan? True. This, this is all. All the fathers are, are clear about that, um, and I actually could have gone into that, but I figured that was a little bit well, arcane. Right. I think you did last year. Maybe I did last year. Yeah, I did last year. Uh, that's that's true. I remember that now. But yes, he's, he's from the tribe of Dan, and there are a number of things that indicate that. Uh, initially, it's indicated by the blessing of uh, Jacob on the twelve of his twelve sons, or Joseph, Joseph, Jacob, Jacob, yeah. And anyway, Jacob on his twelve sons, and you know Judah is given all of this. Judah is, you know, he's, he's elevated because from Judah will become the king. But from Dan is basically he will bite at his at the heels of his brothers and they'll fall off the horse and, and won't be able to get up. <laughs> you know, this is this and goes, so it starts there. You go and, and in Revelation this, this was last year the year before I can't even remember when, when they're talking about the list of all of the tribes in Revelation. Dan isn't there. The twelve tribes are listed, but Dan isn't there. Levi replaces Dan. Because Levi was never never numbered among the twelve. Well, one question. Well, a separate question. So it was interesting that you mentioned the the prophet that will precede the Antichrist in the same way as I thought. You have John the Baptist, the forerunner, preceding Christ. Can you read this? Yeah, that's all there. Uh, <laughs> is there a uh, an anti? Theotokos? Is, there, is she the more bound one that's mentioned, or is there somebody else? Is there... I think the more the, the bound one, I think, is next year, probably in the, in the next section. But uh, no, because uh, the, there won't be anyone, there, there won't be a, a, an anti Theotokos because it, it, it does say that, that the Antichrist will be born of an impure woman naturally of an impure woman out of, out, out of her sin. Uh, it does say, you know, we, we, do, we do know that, but uh, whether or not she's honored or, or revered in any way, we don't know. 
Anything else? Uh, yeah. Um, at the end of the uh, reign of the Antichrist, uh, then will Jesus come and oh, yes. set up the kingdom of heaven? Oh, yes. We go back to the, we go back to what we were talking about the prophets, you know, and they're killed, they're taken up to heaven, and immediately Christ comes. I mean, we're already, we've already gone through, you know, seven seals and seven trumpets, and at the end, the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet is always the second coming of Christ. So we're already there. This is just John backtracking and say, I'm giving you a little more detail. And it's like, okay, we got to the end. Now we're going to go back and get some detail, and. You know, and the same thing will happen. We'll get to the end, and then we'll get some more detail. And uh, and, and so he, he does this over and over again in Revelation. That's why you can't start at the beginning and go to the end. Is because he goes to the end, and then he goes back, and then he goes to the end again, and he goes back, and then he goes to the end again, and he goes back. So we can't, you know. Can't write Genesis. Yeah, yeah Genesis does that too. Two, two version. Yeah. When it talks about creation, it, it goes through all of creation, and then it goes through all of creation again. Being surrounded by so many biblical scholars, I feel reluctant to speak up. But um, I'm wondering: um, is does our church recognize the stigmata as any kind of mark of anything? Um, well, the stigmata are true with the wounds of Christ, and He has them, but they're not emphasized at all. Uh, the, the the idea of of, of Acquire, you know, our saint, uh, the the saints do not acquire upon themselves the stigma; they acquire the divine life. You know that that's what's given to them. They, 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 they are radiant with the, with the light of Christ. They are they, they aren't uh, they don't have the wounds of Christ. This is this is considered a, a, a passionate um, a counterfeit, if anything. You know, that it's, it's, it's given the the. the, the, the Saint, the, 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 the saints who, or the people who manifest these things are, uh, do so because they have, they have um, nurtured within themselves this passionate recollection of the suffering of Christ. You know, the, 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 the um, Mel Gibson's movie, The, 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 the the passions would never have been made by an Orthodox person because we don't look at the suffering. I mean, it's important, yes, and it's good to know it. But look at Christ on the cross. He doesn't hang on the cross. He stands on the cross. He is there, as I said, voluntarily, but he is also there as the victor over death. He isn't killed by the cross. He gives his life up. He surrenders his life voluntarily. You know, it's not ripped from him, but it's voluntarily given. So, yes, uh, we recognize the wounds of Christ. And, you know, I was probably a little bit harsh in talking about the stigmata, but at the same time, it's, it, the best we can say is, you know, no, it's never happened to our saints. But in the Catholic Church, of course, there are number yeah. of people. But in the Catholic Church, no one, no one acquires a divine light either. <laughs> At least not since the schism. Gregory, Donald Lurie, so anyway. Anyway, anyone, any, any other comments? Mentioned, uh, in the 80s and 90s, there was this group that tried to remove all the miracles. Yeah. Was, was that the, the Jesus Seminar? Uh, yeah. You know, Jesus Seminar, I think, was, I, was I one, of the main, know, one of the groups, yeah. I don't know if they're like related to the World Council of Churches. Oh, yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah, but it reminds me of like Jefferson's Bible. Tom Jefferson, he had a Bible. Right. And he cut out all the miracles of Jesus. <laughs> he out of yeah, he, uh, he abridged it so that it made sense to him. It's, it's in his museum today. Long to tell, right? Actually, it wasn't. I don't know where. It was. Wasn't it? One of those was, it was it uh, destruction? He had a KJV. Was it Obama who was, who was sworn in on Jefferson's Bible? <laughs> uh, I believe. Maybe his, his, his I think. Bible. I, I vaguely remember this. I'm not sure. Obama? I thought it was before him. Was it before him? Then it was Bush? Or Clinton? I mean, one of those had Jefferson's Bible taken out of the archives so that he could swear the oath of office on Jefferson's Bible. I can't remember which one it was. I remember that happened, though. No, no, no. Oh, I don't know. Sorry when I get into that, but it makes me... Democrats aren't necessarily known for their, their, their adherence to... 
literal scripture. <laughs> well, we're speaking of demo democracy. Never mind. Yes, yes, democracy. We'll talk about, we know a little bit about democracy. The, the guys in the Jesus Seminar, they're voting. They say, I believe Jesus did this. Cast your vote. Show the, the red card. Yeah. yeah. You know, some kind of democratization of religion. If we want to vote for, what is it, gay marriage, okay, right? Yeah. Um, isn't, doesn't that contribute to kind of this uh, antichrist? He's right. overturning, overturning the law of God. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, 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 I think that also, you know, overturning nature that counts as daylight savings time. <laughs> <laughs> we pretend that it's not, but it really is. Yes. Anyway, let's just be. Any other questions? Question okay. Uh, in the prophet Ezekiel, it says, "And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst uh, to this. Uh, I think he said angel, or the the man clothed with linen. Go through the midst of the city. Go through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within. And then to the others, he said, In my hearing, go after him through the city and kill." Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, and little children and women, mm -hmm. but do not come near anyone on whom is Mark. Uh, and begin at my sanctuary. Is that Mark? I mean, it's... That's, that's, that's a, a, a type, a foreshadowing mm -hmm. of what will happen. Yes. Was that a spiritual Mark, or was that... It was probably a physical mark. It may well have been the mark of the cross because the, the Jews knew that, knew the, the the mark of the cross. They knew that because that was the, the, the mark on the door at, at, at the Passover. The head post and the lintels, the sign of the cross. They knew that sign. Moses put the serpent on a pole, a cross. They knew that sign. So it very well could have been a cross. Kind of similar thing. Ezekiel's right up there with Revelation. It's just weird, weird to understand. <laughs> but but every time we talk about this mark, it's, or in anything in Revelation, it seems we're talking about people as plural. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the the Medes, the Persians, the the right. I don't know what the Americans. Just kidding. Um, you know, some group of people who are, are forgive me. Some group of people who are, are saved, right? Mm -hmm. So where do we draw the line between individual, bearing the individual mark, Christ nation, whatever it is, versus the entire nation who is a Christian nation? You know, uh, be saved. Uh, um, Father Athanasius speaks to that in his comments, and and it's and, and we could and, and many of the the uh, uh, pre-revolutionary pre-revolutionary elders in Russia spoke to the, the same way. This is a Christian nation, but just because you were baptized doesn't mean you follow Christ. You have to, you have to act on that baptism. You have to live that life. You can't just sit back and say, oh, I was baptized, I'm good. No. That's no. an individual thing, for sure. Yeah. We, we're, we live in a society where everything's individualist. You know? Yeah. I got saved. I'm saved. To say nothing is good in society and the family. You know? So me, me, me. Yeah, well, that's 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 our that's our North American society, certainly. But and 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 the idea of a people is much more uh, is much stronger in um, in in the, in the old world. Uh, you know, the idea of a tribe and a nation and a family, because those, that's what the nations were. They were tribes. They were families. That. You know, and, and so that, that sense of a people is much stronger. <coughs> there to, like, here. to the mind of ancient people, it would not be very fun to be saved alone. You want your people to be. And, 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 and Jesus, and, and you know, salvation was by the household in the early church. We know that from uh, Paul, from Paul and the, and, the, and, the, and the Philippian jailer. You know, he was saved and all his house. Yeah, yeah. See, so we know that that happened. But in order to, you know, just because, you know, just because uh, I was baptized as a child and I wasn't, you know, if I, worked, if I had been, just because I was baptized as a child doesn't make me part of the nation of saved people, the nation of, of, the, of, of Christ. And see, this is, this is another thing that you see in, in, the, in the writings of the, of, the, uh, of the fathers about the nature of the church is that it is a new kingdom. This is a new kingdom that, oh, that, that, that transcends all of the earthly kingdoms. 
And it's got people drawn from every nation, every people. There is no longer Jew and Gentile. But there, is on, there are only those who believe in Christ and those who don't. And this is a new nation. A new, and so when we talk about the that's nation that's saved, the okay. yeah, that's where we draw the line, is that those who are part of Christ and those who are foreign to Christ. Mm -hmm. Another question. You going to say something? Yeah. Brian? Well, if... Uh, if oh, oh, did you have more? Uh, sit, sit, sit. <laughs> so... Yes, I, I wonder because it's it's never never clear to me. Do, do these guys speak Hebrew? Do they speak Greek? The Orthodox Revelation is written in Greek. The book is written in Greek. So they, they, in Greek they all spoke Greek. That's what the fathers. The fathers all can concur that it probably is is according to the Greek alphabet. But who knows? I guess by that time in history, post Alexander the Great, right? There's yeah, other Greek speakers. Greek was, a, was the, <coughs> the common language of the empire. So is it kind of like a like a Greek gematria then? Well, you, let's say you add up like sigma, theta, epsilon, omicron. Yeah. <coughs> the letters what? of your name. Yeah. Equals 666. Yes. That's, that's, that's the idea, yes. That's it. Because, because so, when, you, when, you, when, you try, yeah, when you when you write like... No, 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 no. Like, like, it, it's, it's, it's the same as Slavonic. Greek, Slavonic, Hebrew is the same way I believe. You know, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, 1, one through 9. J is 10. J-A is 11. J, and so forth. H is, is uh, 30. That's English, Latin. <coughs> yeah, but I, I'm using the Latin now because that's the one we all know. Okay. okay. <laughs> H, I, so you go on and then you get to 100 and 200 and 300 okay. and 1,000. It's not just like the number of the, it's positioning the alphabet, so like oh. 26 letters, it would take a lot. If that's that's, that's how. Six, see, one of these hours teach you how to actually count yes. <laughs> so that you can look up the verses on yourself, on your own, without asking me. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Well, kind of a comment more than anything else. I uh, really uh, like the image of the uh, horns uh, emerging from the water, like the fingers. It reminds me of something that's said about societal change. Um, slowly at first and then all at once uh -huh. and we're seeing things speed up happening right now you know things like a, the dollar losing its its uh, status as a reserve currency and some of these things are are you're just seeing like little little things poking above the water yeah and then it's gonna go just <laughs> kaboom yeah. um a question about symbolism it's observed that the evil ones that are at work in society they just love mm -hmm. symbolism talking about your 666 you know mm -hmm. the monster energy drink that's hebrew 666 that little logo right yeah. um okay that symbolism <laughs> but that symbolism is, is all over the place yeah and especially when you have events like last monday um uh -huh. they drench it in symbolism and they're wondering if your your perspective on is that is that the enemy doing it because he loves to do that kind of thing he wants to pull other people in wants to reveal himself or is God making him do it yes yes <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I remember. no no I think I think I think it's yeah. better to say no yes he's you know the Satan has a program he's working his program and God allows him to do so. Part of your name adds up to 161 in the English form of 231 in the Greek. Okay, sorry. Uh, You're not the beast, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any other questions? Any other comments? Yes. My Russian godmother had a blessed memory. She used to say, uh, we always say it's Greek to me. She said Russian stuff. They say it's Sure, because it was the Greek it was the Greek alphabet that was used to create the Russian alphabet. Right. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. What? Alright, let's say the prayer then. Thank you. 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 Thank you.